Welcome to Everything Co-op, bringing you information on how cooperatives can help improve your quality of life. This show is being sponsored by the National Co-op Bank, NCB. The NCB is dedicated to strengthening communities nationwide for the delivery of banking and financial services for the nation's cooperatives, their members, and other socially responsible organizations. For more information on the power of community ownership, visit ncb.coop. That's ncb.coop. Now stay tuned for your host, Vernon Oaks. Good morning, everybody. This is Vernon Oaks and the radio program. This morning is Everything Co-op. And we have Mr. David Thompson from hot and warm California on the line with us. Good morning, David. Good morning, Vernon. How are you today? I am great. And you? Well, fine. Thank you. Well, thanks for getting up so early. I know it's 730 out there. And being it is on indeed. <laughs> Well, you know, this is Black History Month, and you are one of the people we like to talk to on Black History Month because of your research and your study, both with co-ops and with the civil rights movement. So this year, the focus is on voting. So I've always been curious, and see if you have any thoughts on this, is why is it that people in power don't want people that don't have power to vote? Then that's a question you're asking me. Yes, sir. <laughs> well, it's uh, it's an important question, and um, without a doubt, in the United States in particular, there are some of the most atrocious acts of voter suppression uh, that that goes on, and um, the powerful, to a great extent, have very little interest and very little to gain from the electorate wishing to choose its own government. So we have a a low voter turnout. We have huge amounts of voter suppression. We don't have, in most cases, same-day voter registration. There are... um, you know, lots of different things that go on, but people without power, poor people, racial minorities, um, quite more frequently than others, are um, not encouraged to vote and and are in a way discouraged from mm-hmm. voting. Mm-hmm. So um, the the benefit of that is that the uh, rich and powerful get to have a stronger voice because the uh, the voiceless and the powerless are not at the table. So the rich and powerful have a stronger voice. They do. Mm-hmm. Well, it, it is um, it is out of proportion to the millions of people in this country that um, you know, either choose not to vote or are discouraged from voting or are discouraged from feeling that their vote has a value. So when I hear a, a particularly younger black person say, my vote doesn't count, so I'm not voting, mm-hmm. I, I too often think that if if your vote didn't count, the man in power wouldn't fight so hard to make sure you can't vote. The vote has a lot of power, a lot of potential, has a, has, gives people a say in this democracy. And people fight too hard. They purge lists and they do all kinds of things so that blacks, Hispanics, Native Americans can't vote. And they used to didn't want women to vote. Yeah, it wasn't that long ago. Yeah. And I think that's what they still want. They're kind of like, uh, we'll let women vote, but the rest of y'all, no, let's purge these lists. Let's do these things. Let's make it hard for people to vote. And if it's hard for people to vote, then they won't vote. And then we can do what we want, however we want. Okay, the rich and powerful have a stronger voice. Thank you, sir. Yeah, yeah. Well, I was uh, contemplating on that. Uh the fact that uh, Frederick Douglass, when he went to England in 1845 and 1847, he um, 
he he was uh, not safe for him to be in the United States was very fascinated by the liberals in England who at that time were collecting money, buying land, and then parceling the land out into small parcels that were large enough to give the individuals the right to vote. Because in those days, only males who owned a certain level of property could vote. And uh, there were numerous um, cooperative colonies created throughout Britain where the liberals would buy up that property and then parcel it out to individuals. And uh, many of those individuals were the creators of the first cooperative in Rochdale, England. Um, But that was the way that they were able to get the vote, and that was the way they were able to uh, um, get um, get land enough of value to be able to you know to get that vote. So Frederick Douglass was um, quite uh, interested in that program and went to visit one of the colonies that had been created uh, in Buckinghamshire for him to see that um, ordinary people were getting the vote through this ownership of land you know, divided up cooperatively. Wow. So I guess he got a real good lesson on what people will do to be able to vote. They had to buy land and then parcel it out. He had to have so many, I don't know, hectares, acres, or so many square feet of land in order to be able to vote. Correct. So that's a real good example of the rich having control. Because Mm -hmm. normally the rich are the only ones that have land, they're landowners, and the poor, the peasants, didn't have land. So the peasants' voice was not heard. It was just not at the table. No. So you did things, maybe taxation, would you put taxes in to tax the poor and not tax the rich so much? Maybe. That's what the... (laughs) And owners would do. Well, there was the poll tax, right? So, what was the poll tax? That was um, a tax on poor people if they wanted to vote. Oh, so going to the poll. So in order yeah. to go to the polls, you could you could pay your way to vote. Mm-hmm. Okay, so somehow you'd have to get enough money to own land or pay in order to vote. Right. They made it difficult, didn't they? Right. So. Frederick Douglass went over there as a slave. Uh, He worked and he got donations and he bought his freedom and came back a freedman. Tell me, what what do you think was the earliest known attempt by the cooperatives to register African-Americans to have a right to vote? Well, I think from from what I know and from the research that I've done, a, a very unique experiment occurred on St. John's Island, which is in uh, South Carolina. Um, it is a few miles away from Charleston. And at the time, there, there, were, there was no bridge between Johns Island and Charleston. Um, and so only the ferry that was there. But a young uh, man uh, called Esau Jenkins owned um, a little bus and he used to take uh, people from uh, from black people from St. John's Island into Charleston across on the ferry uh, for them to go to work each day and then would pick them up in the evening and bring them back home. Um, he, along with a group of others, uh, formed a cooperative on St. John's Island called the Progressive Club. And the Progressive Club had a store, it was a cooperative store, where they bought all of the things that they could from. And in the back of the store was a meeting room. And in that meeting room, uh, Jenkins and others uh, created a classroom to teach uh, black residents of of, uh, South Carolina how to take the test to be able to get the vote. The, um, the test was very uh, difficult, and uh, the local um, um, commissioners would make it really, really hard for blacks to even dare go through the door and uh, try to get the vote. 
um, because they would be uh, uh, tricked into various uh, um, questions and answers that they would not know the answer to. And um, in this classroom at the back of the co-op store, uh, Esau and others uh, taught people um, what the questions were and what the answers were. Uh, he also did it on his bus. And so going in and out every day on the bus, uh, he would teach um, blacks who, for the most part, didn't read or write in many cases, um, how to take the test and teach them how to read and write specifically, you know, how to answer the test. So that um, was, to me, the first time that a cooperative was playing a role in introducing um, voter registration and the impact that it would have uh, to the people living on St. John's Island. Um, at one point, they, uh, Esau and Septima Clark, who was the, uh, one of the teachers at the uh, class, um, were asked to go to the Highlander Center up in Tennessee and give a talk there on what they were doing and how they were doing it because the Highlander Center wanted very much for this program to, uh, to, to go throughout the South. And one of the attendees at uh, one of those workshops was Rosa Parks from Birmingham, Alabama. So she and Septima Clark became close friends for the rest of their life. Uh, they became uh, engaged highly in uh, civil rights acts and voter registration and uh, numerous things like that. But um, I think it rather lovely in a way that this tiny little co-op on this small island um, off the coast of South Carolina was where uh, voter registration classes uh, took their first form and then um, and then ended up um, uh, registering about a million voters in the South through using that same kind of program. That's fantastic. And we're going to take our first break. But so what I got is the rich and the powerful don't want other people, the non-rich, to vote because it gives them a stronger voice. And that right. makes all the sense in the world. And they make it hard in England, Frederick Douglass found out that they made it hard by saying you have to own land or you have to pay money in order to vote. In order to go to the poll, to vote, you have to pay money, poll tax. And in the U.S., with in the South, they said you have to pass a test. And it made it very, very difficult for you to pass that test. We'll be right back. And we want to talk some more about this voting and uh, African Americans in the civil rights movement as it particularly relates to co-op. We'll be right back. Information is power. That's why WOL is a great partner for this program. We're trying to give you information about co-ops and how they function, how they work, which would cause you to go out and use it, start your own co-op or go find a co-op to do business with. That's where the power comes. The power comes with putting the information to action. And Mr. David Thompson is our guest today, basically talking about voting and voting rights and how people, normally the rich people, want to make it so that the poor, the impoverished, uh, those groups of people, that if they're afraid that if the poor and the impoverished had a say and voted, then they would vote people in that would do things that's good for them. And when they don't have a chance to vote, then the people that vote would vote people in that would do things that are good for them. So if the rich want to have a bigger voice, they just make sure that nobody else can vote. Then they vote for the people they want. And those people then would create policies that are good for the rich. And could be harmful for the masses of people. So, David Thompson, we're talking about South Carolina. About what is the timing in this? Um, what what year are you talking about with Satima Clark and Esa Jenkins? 
Uh, these were the um, the late 1950s. Okay. Uh, when that was happening, in fact, one of the uh, requirements of being a member of the Progressive Club Cooperative was that you had to, uh, as part of being a member of the cooperative, you had to go out and uh, urge uh, other blacks on the island to um, take the voter registration classes and help them pass that so that they increased the number of people who were able to vote in uh, on St. John's Island, which was at the time uh, a black majority population, but um, ruled by uh, white farmers. Oh, so the majority of the people on the island were black, but the farmers, the white farmers, made up the rules. They they decided who they were wanting to get elected, and then those elected officials would create p- policies, laws that were good for the farmers and maybe not good for the majority of the people, which were black. Mm-hmm. I really want people out there to get, particularly young folks, that the the rich and the they don't want you to vote. So when you give give up and say my vote don't count or something like that, that's exactly what they want. And they go through all of these lengths to make sure you don't go vote. So what I like about this cooperative model is that the the first principle is volunteer and open membership. So it doesn't make any difference what your race or religion or political uh, suasion is, it, it's open, if it's a true cooperative. And the second one is democratic member control. So it's in the, it's in the DNA, it's in the, the structure of a co-op to have one member, one vote. So this stuff is in there. And so when you start looking at what's in the co-op, it's one member, one vote, and the members get that, and they want that to be the same as when they go out in the community. That each, each and, person- and the distinction, as you know, uh, Vernon, is that uh, in consumer cooperatives and housing cooperatives and credit unions, your vote is based upon you being a member as a one single human being. Mm-hmm. In all of the consumer cooperatives and the credit unions, the vote is not related to how much money uh, you have, how many shares you have, uh, how big your unit is, those things. Uh, so it, it takes the money element out of the vote element uh, by giving it to each single human being and uh, not being based on uh, the economics of uh, who who you are and what you have. So it's um, it's it's really one of the great democratic organizations in the world. Because it it takes uh, it takes wealth out of the equation. So this is a co-op. It takes wealth out of the equation. I like one member, one vote. So let me quickly tell people out there the four types of co-ops because you mentioned one and it's consumer. But if a, if a co-op is owned and controlled by the people that work in a business, the employees, then it's called a worker cooperative. So any business you can think of could be owned by the workers. If it's owned and controlled by the people that uses the product or service, it's called a consumer uh, co-op. And you mentioned two, and that is housing co-ops and credit unions. REI is another uh, consumer cooperative. And then you have, and farmers use this a lot, um, purchasing co-ops. So a group of farmers get together and they create a business and they hire staff that learn about what's the best seed and what's the best fertilizer and what's the best. And they learn this and they negotiate contracts and so forth with vendors for the farmers. And the farmers couldn't do that by themselves. And that's called a purchasing co-op. In the district, there's something called CPA, which is a consumer purchasing alliance that was formed to help churches and other nonprofits buy. And they were able to help particular churches save a lot of money. And then on the other side of the farm, you have a marketing co-op, and some call them producer co-ops, so that the farmers, uh, the cattle farms and milk farming, they they all 
they form a company again and they all give their milk or sell their milk to this company and they produce the milk or the cheese or butter or whatever they they going to make with this and they can get it to different markets that the farmer could not get it to so in all of these there's one member one vote david i've just gotten uh knowledge of a um uh entertainment co-op that uh well i didn't just hear about it but it's it's always refreshing to me that these entertainers got together and they formed a co-op and if one had a gig this week and the other ones may not, he would put his money into the pot. And he may not have a gig next week, but the other one would, and he put the money in the pot. And they sort of flatten out that everybody had money all the time. So it wasn't mm. this feast or famine, that kind of thing. Mm-hmm. And it's an sort of interesting way of using the co-ops because everybody can't be uh, Michael Jackson or a prince in order to get all of his money coming in. So it's it's just a a nice way using the co-op model to to help out. Okay, so we mm-hmm. we got the four types of co-ops. We've got all of these principles. Now we hit the fifth principle, and that is education, training, and information. And that's what they were doing at the um, co-op store in the back room and on the bus, educating and training and giving people the information so they could pass this test so they could vote. It's huge, right? I find it phenomenally right. huge that people would go go and do all of this work to be able to vote. And then I have people, not every day, but a lot of days saying, oh, my vote don't count. Oh, my vote don't count. And that's sickening. Oh, what can we do? Got any ideas? Well, I think that um, the, uh, the model of the Highlander Center uh, should not be forgotten uh, because uh, in many ways, that was the uh, the core organization that was distributing the ideas about how to how to do voter registration. And um, different groups would come to the Highlander Center, uh, community groups, uh, groups like the uh, NAACP. Uh, unions, um, all sorts of organizations would come to learn how do we get the vote because if we have the vote much more representative of the communities in which we live, then we're going to likely have better decisions made about the resources that are needed and where those uh, resources should be spread. So um, at the moment, you know, voter registration ought to be uppermost uh, in the minds of uh, a lot of organizations because we we have too many people whose needs are um, really quite major in our society who do not believe that voting uh, makes much of a difference. And uh, we know that it does, but we do need organizations to go out there and to um, go amongst the poor in particular and racial minorities in particular and uh, teach them how important the vote is, how powerful um, an element it can be and how different a nation we might have if more people uh, who are poor and more racial minorities participated in the uh, in the exercise of voting. Now, David, we have to take our second break, and we'll be right back. I totally enjoy talking to you. The time goes by very, very quickly. But particularly to talk about how to get voter registration going and get other organizations to do that. But we'll be right back. This is Vernon Oaks. Uh, David Thompson is our guest today, and we're talking about the role that cooperatives played in helping African Americans exercise their right to vote. And that is a strong, sort of like getting 
co-ops, this this almost not known business entity to take a major role in getting African Americans to go out and vote. Well, David, do you know of any other besides the Highlander School and the school in St. John's Island that that help minorities to get the vote? Well, what I, I think about is uh, Septima Clark and Esau Jenkins, you know, took that idea to the Highlander Center. And the Highlander Center was um, a, a kind of an organizing hub um, for the South um, and did a lot of transfers of information. But the Highlander Center itself uh, was a kind of a cooperative uh, all of the people who were members had one vote in appointing the board of directors and, um, you know, setting the policies for the organization. So the Highlander Center should indeed be looked at as we as we look at voter registration and look at the impact that the Highlander Center had. But, um, you know, Martin Luther King ended up going there for classes uh, Rosa Parks, Andrew Young, um, almost, you know, John Lewis, um, almost everybody that we know who became a leader in the civil rights movement um, spent time at the Highlander Center and uh, took these classes on voter registration and learned how to spread that. And one of the, I think it was the Marshall Field Foundation uh, out of Chicago, uh, gave money to the Southern Christian Leadership Conference uh, for them to take that program that had started in that co-op and um, take it to every place in the South that they could to extend the uh, information and knowledge that was needed for people to be able to pass the different registration tests that each uh, state had. And uh, as I said earlier, I, I believe around about a million blacks were registered uh, in the South as a result of that. And it was, you know, one of the elements of um, uh, bringing power, bringing uh, economic and electoral power to people who had never been able to taste uh, any little bit of that because uh, the basic element was that they were... Uh, not encouraged to vote and uh, couldn't vote, and it was made difficult for them to vote. So that um, that power did begin to uh, change the South and change the nature of it. But, um, you know, the rich and powerful um, spend um, a part of every day uh, trying to figure out how to uh, discourage people from voting. So it's it's an ongoing problem. And, um, you know, we have a very low voting rate in the United States um, as a result of how effective it has been. And um, the, um, you know, the, the start in that little cooperative uh, was a critical feature in changing um, the attitudes towards the vote. But um, we we are up against it again. And um um, need to um, repeat some of those uh, programs. And I I think, you know, if uh, dollars are to be given to any of these things, I think the best dollar spent will be in voter registration programs um, throughout um, the poor communities uh, throughout the United States um, so that, um, you know, people can have some ability to impact the outcome. Other than purging roles, what, what are other ways that the people in power make it hard for African Americans and others to vote? Well, um, you know, voter registration itself, you know, the, uh, the IDs um, that are now required of people to be able to bring, to be able to show that you know, they were born in the country, that they uh, are um, a citizen in one way or the other. One has to remember that um, poor folks don't, you know, don't mainly have cars and have difficulty getting transportation. So, you know, getting to the uh, voter registrar to be able to um, apply for, you know, the, the uh, 
the 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 permit to vote to be able to provide all of the uh, information that's needed to to be able to get the vote that is um, you know that's a, a lot of work for a lot of people especially older people um, a lot of travel that they have to do um, there's um, you know, there's there's more difficulty put in the way of many people being able to vote than there is uh, going to the grocery store and using your, uh, you know, your um, credit card to buy groceries. You know, you, you you do it right on the spot, as you might say. So, mm -hmm. but um, getting the vote, um, you know, is uh, is is a hard process and takes a lot out of people, and uh, many many people give up. And then, of course. You have um, the long lines of voters, uh, you know, arriving at the polls. Why does it take so long? Why do we have voting on a Tuesday, which is a work day? Um, why can't it be on a Saturday or a Sunday when more people are off and, and have the time to be able to do that? Why don't we have same day registration? You know, why? You know, do you have to do these things, let's say, two months or three months before? You know, it is on people's minds that, you know, if they want to vote in November, they have to register in, you know, July or August. All of these things are, you know, real, um, a real deterrent to people being able to have the vote. Um, it should not be so difficult. I have it that if you're born in America, you go vote, take your whatever you you need, take your birth certificate, take your Social Security card. But you're American and there's always going to be somebody that says you weren't born here. You were born in Kenya or somewhere else. But, hey, that's what people say. I don't. All right. I, I get frustrated. I'm sitting here listening to you and going, how could we get this Highlander Center, what, has that closed down? No, no, it's um, it's still very much in operation. It, it's um, board of directors take on different tasks. Um, I think at the moment, uh, one of the main things that the Highlander Center is doing is um, working with communities in the south, particularly in the coal mining areas, to help them to clean up the streams and the water supply because there's a lot of poisoning activities that are going on in many of those uh, coal communities and industrial communities in the south. And so they're working with a lot of community organizations to um, teach them how to organize to be able to you know, take political action and to clean up the communities in which they live. Well, I grew up in West Virginia, so that's definitely cold country. But I'm thinking mm -hmm. of Duke Energy in, in North Carolina where they're using the coal and then the soot from the coal, the, the, that which is left after you burn the coal, is what's poisoning the streams. And so it may not right. be a coal community. It may be the use of coal is what is right. is messing up the streams. And they seem they put these plants in poor communities. Yeah, yeah. So. In fact, um, sort of an interesting little tidbit about um, the Highlander Center is that uh, the, the song We Shall Overcome, they actually hold the copyright on because the it, it was a hymn uh, brought to the Highlander Center uh, by um, blacks from South Car Carolina in particular. And um, the hymn was worked on a lot in particular by uh, Pete Seeger uh, to bring new words and new meaning to it all. And uh, Pete Seeger and the others passed over the copyright to the song uh, to the Highlander Center. And every year, uh, they have a competition, and uh, people who are doing wonderful things in their communities are asked to apply for funds, and the income that they get from the royalties for We Shall Overcome um, uh, fund a lot of community uh, action throughout the South. So from previous conversations with you, I get the Highlander Center is not in Tennessee anymore. Where Where is it? No, we, no, it's in Tennessee. Uh, we threatened to go down there sometime, and we haven't done oh. it. <laughs> <laughs> well, it moved. 
So um, where historically we think it it, um, it is, which I think was New Market in Tennessee, um, it has now moved, um, and I don't know what the town is now, but it's still in in very much based in rural Tennessee. Okay, I'd, I'd like to go visit it. Yeah, yeah, I would too. Okay, I may not have to wait on you anymore. I think I may have to go, but we figure out. I'm, I am real, particularly with this voting thing that's going on now and seeing what they are doing and then how to um, support them in any way to get the vote out. Right, so right. Yeah, I, I, and, and now after this broadcast, I'll go online and take a look and see what kind of focus um, the Highlander Center has. In my home, when growing up, um, there were there were ten people in a three bedroom house, and um, David, the the house was the the top floor. It was a square, uh-huh. and if you just take two lines and right down the middle of the squares, there was no hallway. But that broke up to four rooms. So one was the living room. Then there were three bedrooms. Mm-hmm. At one point. The, the six children, the three boys and the three girls, had, was in the same bedroom when we were mm-hmm. much younger. And boys in one bed, girls in another bed. My father and mother was in another bedroom, and my grandfather and grandmother were in another bedroom. Eventually, my grandfather and grandmother moved out back. So the girls had their room, the boys had their room, and my parents had a room. But when you came time to voting... It was kind of like celebration. It was active and movement. Everybody went to vote. I was, it was amazing looking back on that. My grandfather, grandmother, mom and dad, the neighbors, everybody's going to vote. And I don't get that same sense. Maybe it is in some neighborhoods. Uh, but I, I got that very, very early on. Matter of fact, my whole life, it was with, with them. It's time to go vote. I don't, I don't care what else was going on. So what was your experience growing up with voting? And we are, got another minute before we take our next break. Yeah. Well, I, I, I of course, grew up in England. And um, I was aware of the vote very, very early on. <laughs> kind of a simple little thing, but I'm as an Englishman, I'm a soccer fan, just like everybody else. Mm-hmm. Um, but one of the great soccer players in England um, played for the team in my town, and he was running to be on the council for the town. His name was Stanley Mortensen. And hold that. We'll yeah. be right back. I want to hear what this soccer team guy did. We'll be right back. This is Vernon Oaks. The program is Everything Co-op, brought to you by the National Cooperative Bank, whose mission is to work with communities, cooperative communities and their members, uh, and providing great financial services to these communities, especially low-income communities. And that's what we're talking about, low-income communities and getting the vote out and how co-ops have helped these low-income communities get the vote out, get the training that they need, get the knowledge to know why their vote is important. And David, you were talking about before we took break, your experience with your soccer team, this great soccer player is now running for city council. (laughs) Okay. And um, I, I, I don't know, I'd probably be uh, 12 or 13, something like that. Um, So, yeah, he came knocking on the door of uh, my auntie. Uh, I was, uh, I think she was probably sort of doing childcare for me or something after school and wanted to find out, you know, if she would vote for him. Uh, so that, that that was my first kind of knock on the door part of learning about the vote. But um, you have reminded me that 
the more peculiar component of that is um, I was at my Auntie Francis's when uh, another knock on the door came, and uh, this time it was the uh, conservative member of parliament who was um, wanting to be re-elected. And uh, he invited my uh, Auntie Francis to bring me and to, to go into his Rolls Royce and he would drive her to the poles. And, you know, this was a street of like 50 houses all next to each other, all adjoining, uh, you know, a working class terrace as, mm-hmm. it, as mm-hmm. it was. And uh, that was my first ride in a Rolls Royce. And, um, you know, you can imagine how what kind of an impact um you know, sort of wealth, you know, has upon somebody when they're going to do their boat, you know. So I'm sure my Auntie Frances voted for him because she got this ride in the Rolls Royce, but um, it, 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 wasn't, it wasn't a vote in her best interest. But mm. it, it, for that day, it was a lovely day, you know. Well, you bring up a whole nother subject matter, and that is, and I, I really think about West Virginians that... Um, why people will vote for people that they know or they ought to know that are not going to do what's best for them. Matter of fact, they do what's worse for them. And sometimes it looks like um, there may be one thing that they have in common. The person might say, well, I'm, I'm going to b- make sure that uh, that women cannot have an abortion. Mm-hmm. OK. And so. The Bible Belt people say, yeah, 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 and they go vote for him. But all of the economics, um, the jail sen- sentencing, because you have the opioid kind of problems in West Virginia, it, they'd be against all of that. And so this, it's like when you look at the whole picture, they're voting for people that are not going to do what's best for them. And I can't I can't get that. Maybe it's a ride in the Rolls Royce, which I doubt down there. Okay. <laughs> But somehow people will vote, even the ones that can vote and do vote, and choose somebody that's going to put in policies and laws that are detrimental to them. I've I've, I've puzzled that one a lot. I don't get mm-hmm. that. One. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, a lot a lot went on in the nineteen um, sixties, and um, a lot of. Um, Progress was made. Uh, a lot of um, harm and hurt were done to those who were doing their best to uh, give people uh, political and economic power. Those were times that um, you know are are treasured. And uh, as time goes by, uh, people you know don't don't have that same encouragement. But we we forget that the the vote is a, a critical element uh, for designing our society and uh, creating um, a vision of what ought to be. And um, when when we uh, don't vote um, or, or choose not to vote or um, don't think it makes a difference, it really, really does. And listeners uh, to the program uh, should indeed be... Uh, Going, you know, home tonight and making sure that, uh, you know, the family are voting, the people you work with are voting, uh, the people you go to church with are voting. It's uh, it's a it's a critical time for the country, uh, for democracy to uh, um, make its voice heard and for everybody to play a role. Well, all right. So what I did while you were talking was I looked up Highlander School. It was called Highlander Folk School. Yeah. And it's now called the Highlander Research and Education Center. Uh Uh-huh. In Newmarket, Tennessee. Oh, it is in Newmarket, Tennessee. Okay. 1959 Highlander Way. So I am going to look at going down there pretty soon. Okay. See how I might get involved to get the vote out to get people trained. We got eight months before the election. Right. Yeah, but only X number of months to voter registration, which allows you to vote in November. Yeah. If it turned out to be July, you have to register in July. Then you only have February, March, April, May, June, July, six months. 
if that's the case. So it's finding out right. in your where you live, what is the registration piece of that? Mm-hmm. And everybody, everybody out there need to check to see if you're registered. Just because you're registered last year doesn't mean you're registered this year with the way they've been doing the purging and stuff. So you right. need to check now to make sure you're registered. And if you're not registered, then do what you need to do to get registered and then vote. Yeah. Make sure you vote. Right. Okay, David, what else would you like to tell folks? Now, it looks like both of us are suffering from a cold. I've been coughing and you've been coughing. Uh, yeah, yeah. It's not not so much a cold. It's the early morning air. <laughs> oh, yes. <that's> okay. <laughs> well, mine is a cold. Okay. I'm sorry. Okay. I'm sorry. Yes, yeah, so, uh, um, all, all is well. So any other ideas on what we could do to get people to get out and vote? Well, um I mean, there, 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 there are lots of potentials, but uh, I, I think without a doubt, uh, because of the efforts that numerous states are putting into voter suppression, um, opposing voter suppression whenever we possibly can, and encouraging voter registration drives, um, you know, those, those are the critical, the two critical features. Um, Probably very little else counts as much as they do uh, at, at this particular time. So it seems like getting organizations, because it would be hard for an individual to do it, but how can you get churches, as an example, to do voter registration drives? Yeah, and I, I think also the um, immigration uh, groups and um, Hispanic groups in particular have quite an opportunity to uh, – they. You know, the, the, the number of um, Hispanics who are registered and don't vote is very high. And um, and so um, a lot of groups are beginning to pay attention to the fact that uh, we could increase ver- voter turnout uh, quite strongly if we got people who were registered to actually vote. What about getting credit unions to put something in those sheets of paper that says, go vote, make sure you're registered? Well, that could be done. Each credit union, you know, could take that kind of an action. And I think that all all organizations should, um, you know, put, put much more effort into um, getting people to uh, to register to vote and to vote when the time comes. I mean, it's... Uh, you know, if if we want to have a democratic society, we we need to, you know, encourage people to to do that voting, and uh, that will be done by uh, groups that people belong to will be much more forceful and have much more impact uh, if if they turn around and ask their members and churchgoers to uh, to register to vote and to vote. Yeah. So we could, in looking at the the co-op world, we could look at credit unions that have got millions and millions of people, uh, housing co-ops, all of these consumer co-ops that we were talking about earlier. Yeah, yeah. To get out all of them. them should. All right, David. One minute, last minute. What else? Would, what would you like to leave people with? <laughs> I don't know. Get out <laughs> and vote. I, I... Please, please, please vote. You know, um, I um, in the minute that you have. Um, I was asked by the Black Consumers Union in South Africa to uh, go there to help them start cooperatives, which they were not legally allowed to do. And um, it was unique being in a nation where blacks, because of the color of their skin, were not allowed to vote. I mean, I went there in the apartheid era. And David, um, we got to cut it. I'm sorry, buddy. Yeah. Thank you so very much, man. Thanks a lot. <laughs> <laughs>